language. Yeah, if you're going to write from scratch, what kind of language do you do? And these are just some pointers of things that I've come across. And, um, so feel free to ignore them if, if you don't think it's true. But these are some of the things that um, how I feel about writing fuzzers is that scripting languages usually um, are a lot um, better or easier because um, you can write less code and have the same thing that you know um, the same thing that you would have in uh, C code. Um, to give you an example and come back to Scappy, is that the um, the Microsoft um, bug where they had a bug in IP option parsing, and it was a um, a proof of concept code public for that was a piece of C code, which was about 150 lines of C code, and in Scappy that's a single line of code. So um, in, and Scappy is written in Python by the way, so that's one line of Python code basically. Um, so scripting languages are really cool and um, it goes a lot faster if you write stuff in scripting language, usually. Um, the other thing is obviously that, because um, scripting languages are generally slow, um, is that your fuzzing on itself will be slower. And um, one of the things I've noticed about Python is that it's really slow compared to like Perl or something. But you can optimize Python code, so that's good. Um, most people also recommend using scripting languages, because it's just easier to write stuff. However, uh, one of the things that I've, uh, I've kind of um, experienced is that, um, these kind of um, scripting languages, they're really cool if you want to do um, like ASCII-based protocols and stuff like that. But if you've got stuff where you've got um, a lot of binary data, um, it gets kind of messy. I mean, like in Perl and Python, you've got to use PAC and things like that. In C, you don't need those things. It's all native in C, basically. So if you're going to do a lot of binary stuff, um, it's probably not a bad idea to use C. Um, right. Besides all of that, if you don't like any of the languages and you, know, you want to write something in Dylan or uh, Lisp or um, <laughs> Small talk or whatever, you know, go ahead, you know, you should choose a language that you're comfortable with. But these are just some of the, um, the things I've come across. Right. So, um, the other thing is uh, smart fuzzers, um, or not smart fuzzers. Um, basically, you've got two kinds of fuzzers you've got dumb fuzzers and intelligent fuzzers. And the difference is that with a dumb fuzzer, is that usually it takes you between a couple of minutes and an hour or so to write one. So, they're, you know, you can sit down, almost get one immediately, and just start fuzzing. Um, the thing is that um, with dumb fuzzers, you usually don't know the specifics of a protocol, or don't want to know the specifics of a protocol, or a file layout, or um, some API. And you just um, you look at what's valid, and then just change some things in there, and pass it on to uh, whatever you want to try and fuzz. Um, that's uh, shockingly effective, um, honestly. I mean, like the, the Mangle stuff, which is does pretty much the same thing, uh, really took me by surprise. I never imagined that you could break IE and PHP and pretty much a lot of all other stuff with it. Uh, but it does work. Um, the, other, the, the one thing is with dumb fuzzers is that if there's going to be compression and encryption and checksums, that you're not going to get far. Um, building intelligence fuzzer is basically the, the opposite. You know, you know the protocol and the file layout, and you're going to um, implement the um, the fuzzing. Uh, the, excuse me. You're going to implement the uh, encryption and compression and checksums and whatever you need. Um, so building intelligence fuzzers takes a while. Um, obviously, um, they'll be able to fuzz a lot more and go a lot deeper in a lot of code paths. So intelligence fuzzers um, almost always give you better results than dumb fuzzers. Um, so it's kind of a trade-off. I mean, if you just want to go out and find one cool bug, then dumb fuzzers usually will give you good results. If you want to try and get complete or try to get complete code coverage, um, you probably end up building an intelligent fuzzer and spending a couple of days or weeks or even months uh, developing one. Um, so intelligent fuzzers take a lot longer to write, but they give you an awful lot of things usually. Right. So um, some of the things that um, are interesting to fuzz, um, um, binary files, um, you know, uh, movie stuff, um, and uh, all, you know, lot, lots of um, programs that interpret them, you know, QuickTime, real player, media player, M player, you know, tons of stuff. And those are interesting. Um, Save for executable files, um, you know, the Mako and Elf and, what, and whatnot. Because um, you know you can pass those to a kernel, to a kernel, and if if they kind of make crucial mistake there, like, let's say they, they take some length, and they cause heap overflow, whatever, you know that's a local root and that's a local kernel bug. So those are kind of interesting. Um, some more like uh, open off like Office documents, like Open Office um, graphic files. 
And another neat one is file systems, because, um, for example, on, on Linux, you've got like uh, tons and tons of file system support. You know, you got, you know, like with the exception of ZFS, you know, you've got like JFS and UFS, XFS, Riser, and about 20 other file systems. And um, all, all of these, the kernel has to like parse all these file systems. And there's lots and lots of things in there. Um, when I um, had used a mangle tool over um, RiserFS, when I hit, right when I hit the enter button, I got a kernel panic. So um, lots of things that you can do there. Um, not binary files. Um, you can, uh, you know, stuff like XML configuration files, those kind of things. Um, you probably want to have uh, smart fuzzers there, or at least take a, um, a known file that's known to be good, and then have something that's somewhat smart that can say this looks like a string, so I'll change it into something smaller, or put percent n or whatever in it. Um, so, but usually you want to have some kind of intelligence when you're going to um, uh, parse stuff that's not binary. Um, yeah, more stuff to fuzz. Um, you can fuzz, you know, FTP protocol, obviously HTTP, DHCP, NTP, you know, any protocol you can think of, you can probably fuzz. Um, one of the interesting things about FTP is that you've got um, a lot of F FTP fuzzers out there, but at least it looks to me that they're all exceptionally trivial. You know, they take a list of the commands you can and give in the A and B and then some, you know, the more advanced FTP fuzzers, they try some globbing bugs and maybe direct traversals, and that's good if you want to um, find bugs in tutor, FT, tutor FTPD or something on Windows, which nobody uses. But if, if you want to, uh, you know, try and be serious about it and see if you can find some, some neat stuff in, um, like, pro FTPD or something, um, you, you're going to have to look at stuff like race conditions, you know, um, signal race conditions, because you can cause signals with that, like some timing issues. And nobody's ever looked at that with FTP fuzzing. Kind of amazes me because my guess is that you're going to find a lot of cool stuff there. Right, so that's network protocols. APIs, system calls, are the obvious one. Um, graphic libraries are probably the also exceptionally um, obvious ones because they're going to be parsing a lot of, a lot of um, length fields and stuff like that. And you, know, you, you just got to get it wrong once and bam, you know, there's a heap overflow there or something. Right, so even more stuff to fuzz. Um, SUID files, which is what I talked about in like the third slide or something, the, um, um, where you can do like arguments, obviously, environment variables, signals, uh, standard input, and for example, you know, also open a lot of file scriptures and then you know, open 50,000 file files and then don't close them and um, call a suit file. And for example, if you do that in Solaris, you know, you open 50,000 files and you run the ping, you get a seg fault. And, you know, if there are any OpenBZ developers um, in the room, they'll probably go like, yeah, we know those kind of bugs. Base, base, <laughs> I, so, I hear some people laughing, so some people know what kind of bugs uh, I'm talking about. Um, but basically what happens when opening a lot of files is if you've got select loops and stuff like that, um, you've got something which is called an FD set array, which is a, um, a static array on the stack usually. And it usually can only hold like 1,000 or 2,000 um, files. Basically it's got one bit for every file set. So that means if you got uh, if it's got support for 1,024 files, and you open and you've got 1,025 files open, it'll write one bit beyond that array. So those those kind of bugs are pretty neat. And like um, uh, like on the like the BSDs, they fix most of those. Um, on Linux, they're pretty much not exploitable because of very strict R limits. But stuff like HP Unix and Solaris and a lot of other things, you know, just if you open a lot of file scripts and run suits. Nine chances out of ten, you'll you'll get some uh, some very interesting bugs there. So and you can fuzz those things. Um, I've I've never seen anybody do it, but that would be really interesting. Um, and pretty much any input suit can take, and it, it's a lot of stuff, a lot of input. Right. So um, if you're gonna write fuzzing tools, um, there'll be some some things that you want to look at. Okay. Um, obviously, um, size fields, uh, you want to look at strings. And then, like, things that uh, terminate some kind of data and things that mark its beginning. Um, right, so let's look at size fields. Um, obviously, um, one of the interesting ones is um, negative values. I'm sure you've all heard of it or seen some of those things. But um, they do cause a lot of problems. Uh, you know, if you give me a minus one in some stuff, you know, um, that might cause problems. You know, some more examples. You know, um, 
stuff around like the, the boundaries, like where you get integer overflows, those are usually interesting, like um, like um, 7F, FF, and then 08000, so some stuff like that. Um, they can cause under indexing, for example, um, negative values. Um, they can also cause, you know, if you do just do a bound check and you sort that stuff in the sign and teacher, uh, and you check if it's bigger than a sum array, and then use that value to put in a copy loop, it'll get cost to do an unsigned teacher, and very, very bad things happen. Um, the other thing that is sometimes interesting is like if you've got binary protocols where you've got a length field saying the string that's coming is 10 bytes long, and then you've got a string there which is not 10 bytes long, but it's 20 bytes long. And then the program will be like, oh, it's 10 bytes long, that's okay. I'll just use string copy and copy that string into my buffer. So yeah, the length field's right, but the string itself's wrong. So these kind of things, somewhat rare, but they do happen. So you should definitely, if, if you've got these kind of protocols, you should look at that. Those things are interesting. The other one's obviously uh, large positive numbers. Um, they can cause, if, if you use them with multiplication, they can cause integer overflows. Um, if they're um, by themselves unsigned, they can obviously cause integer overflows. Um, yeah, the last one, which is using very small numbers. And that might sound a bit odd, but all too often you see code like there where they've got, you know, the length which you control and they've done some bound checking, like it's not bigger than or maximum value and it's not smaller than zero, then it's okay. And then they come to this part and they say length, and it, at this part they're assuming it's bigger than two or at least two. And it, but you've given in zero or one. And basically, you're under-indexing by a couple bytes. And for example, you know, for string termination or something, and they'll add a zero byte in there. And if you're under-indexing, and this is on the heap, you've got a lot of problems. Right. So th these are some of the size fields that um, you want to take into account. Right. So um, strings. Um, obviously, um, you want to have long strings, really long ones, you know, just in case. Um, somebody left a, um, a trivial stack smashes or some stuff like that in their code. This is kind of the classic. And um, then um, also format string box, you want to look for those, so you put some format string stuff in there. Um, the thing I've seen which is kind of odd or at least a bit disappointing is that um, a lot of the fuzzing tools out there that are going to fuzz for format string box, they're going to use one or two percent ends or they're going to use percent s or something like that. That's not that good. It's not really a good idea to do, do it that way. What you want to do is you want to use lots of pros and ends. You want to use 15 or 20 of them. The reason is that um, uh, if you use pros and s, even if you use 10 or 20 of them, if the stack is laid out just right, nothing's going to crash. If you're going to use pros and ends, even three or four of them, if the stack is laid out exactly right, I mean, it's kind of rare, but I've seen it happen. If it's laid out exactly right, you know, three or four pros and ends, it's still not going to crash. And obviously, you want to get it to crash. So you know, use 15 or 20 of them, and you know, it's almost guaranteed that it'll crash. I've never seen a stack that's that well laid out um, by accident. <clears throat> um, another interesting thing in there is um, if you've got like strings um, and you've got some binary data in there, um, odd things might happen. Um, you know, you can usually, if you if you want to generate those, just grab stuff get stuff out of defu random or something. Um, but if you look at the kind of C code that's there, th and this is very common code, by the way, it's exceptionally common code, um, where basically you've got um, uh, uh, B is a string you control, you know, you've just read it off the network, and you're putting it into this kind of thing. And, you know, you go up to the first zero byte, and then plus one, you do memory location, A, and then you, um, you go, you scroll um, all the way over the array, say, as long as, what's in, in B is equals to, to ASCII A, just increase B. And then um, after the loop, um, you wanna um, jump over another one. Um, what, what people uh, forget here is that you should, you know, in these kind of cases, check for zero bytes, because if you don't, you know, um, basically uh, the string length was used, will go until zero byte, and then the second B++ will jump over to zero byte and um, heap overflow. And this kind of code is exceptionally common. Right, so that's, oh, right, more strings. Um, other things is like, um, when something expects a string, don't give it a string. Um, lots of null point references this way. Um, 
if, if you got like single turret demons and you got no point references, that's a, a, that's a denial, a pretty nasty denial service. Um, the other ones, um, like if you got linked in ASCII values, that's pretty common. And basically just um, try to do, um, keep the size things in mind and just use them in ASCII values. And this is fairly common. Um, a couple of months ago, I discovered a bug in Ethereal where it does this CC parsing, which is distributed, co uh, distributed compiling. And it's got an, it has an ASCII protocol where they say um, an argument, and then they say the length of my argument, and then they give you the argument. And the code basically just took the length, put it in the sign of teacher, you know, said, oh, it's smaller than my buffer. Let's give that length to memcopy, and there was a stack smash. Um, right, so that, that's kind of like, um, these are kind of like the strings that you want to keep in mind. If you're going to um, look at stuff that's going to be written in C, um, some more interesting things, which is um, usually more web related, is um, uh, SQL injection stuff. Um, though it's not always that, uh, at least not um, related as in like um, forms or stuff, but for example, um, a couple of months ago, a friend of mine came across um, some commercial product which had a web server, and he connected to it with a fake browser, and he had SQL injection in his browser version. And it would trigger the um, it would trigger an SQL bu injection bug in this commercial product. So it's not all it's not always in like um, posting to forums and stuff. You can have SQL injection in other places as well. But usually it's in you know web related forums and stuff like that. Yeah, cross site scripting. I'm sure everybody's heard about them. You know, <laughs> some JavaScript alert or something. Um, so yeah, um, if, if you're into cross site scripting and stuff, you can you can probably fuzz a lot of cross site scripting stuff. Um, a bit more damaging stuff is uh, directory traversals. Um, if it's like FTP stuff, you can usually get out of, like in Windows, or at least there have been a lot of them, we can get out of sort of a, you can get out of your true root, or something like that. Um, uh, in like web servers and stuff, it can get pretty nasty, because if you can do directory traversals, you might be able to get command execution from there. Kinda, it kind of depends on the way things have been made. Um, and then the, the, the last one of strings is f command injection. Um, like backticks, for example, um, or uh, you know, um, semicolon or something like that. And it, every time I find one of those, it kind of amazes me that people still make these kind of bugs. I mean, you've got like some high profile demons and stuff out there, where there's this kind of trivial command injection. You give it something that'll give to a shell as an argument, do backticks, and you get a remote root shell or something. It's, yeah, so the, the, these are kind of the strings that you want to look at um, um, when you're um, fuzzing. Right. Um, some more stuff, um, basically um, things that terminate or um, something or that mark its beginning. Um, you know, it can have like no bytes or just four zeros or you know, in, um, or um, brackets stuff like that. Um, and so basically, you know. Kind of things that you want to do is like um, like not use them and just have it endlessly going on, for example, or um, put data that wasn't supposed to be off there off there anyway and see what happens. Um, if if you can like um, if there are ways in the protocol to escape them, you know, um, to escape some stuff, try to escape um, some of these things that mark some beginnings or endings. Uh, it can get it can lead to um, surprising results. Uh, and then um, put several of those off to each other and see what happens. Um, right. Um, how do you want your fuzzer to actually work? The way I usually do stuff is you got uh, you know you define some states of stuff that you want to do, and then um, I just use uh, ran functions to decide what state I want to use, and then just fire that off, and that works pretty well. Um, usually, when you do these kind of things, um, you'll be working in endless loop. Um, yeah, some of the you know, the, the random stuff, you know, ran, arc for random, and some more stuff. Uh, def random and def u random are exceptionally useful. Um, def random might not be that useful for fuzzing, because in fuzzing you want to do stuff very, very quickly, and it doesn't have to be cri cryptographically secure. Um, so def random might not be that good, because um, it's slow. But def u random is wonderful. Um, if you're going to fuzz, it's like, you, know, you can't live without def u random if you're going to fuzz. Or at least I can't live without def u random. Um, yeah, yeah, and it's usually an endless loop that you do these kind of things. The other thing is that usually, and this is, tends to be more towards fault injection, um, if you have a um, 
very detailed analysis of what you're going to fuzz and you've got that all written down and you've got months of development because these kind of sequential fuzz usually take a lot of time to develop. Um, you've got a whole list of stuff you want to do and you just have a for loop. You go from first test case till the last test case and then just run down your list. And that's usually uh, finite in time to do these kind of things. So these are usually two kind of things that you want to decide uh, how you're going to fuzz stuff. Right. Um, the other thing which is um, uh, interesting in design fuzz is that um, you're going to either uh, mutate data or generate data. And mutating data is usually a lot easier because you take data that you know is going to be valid. Uh, if, you, if you've got a protocol, you just you sniff it and you say, this is valid because you know, I've seen it work, it's valid. And you just put it in whatever you're going to fuzz and just um, mutate it. Put, you know, keep it as much intact as it was, but change a few things in there and you know, run it through. So data mutation is usually very easy to make, um, and it is amazingly effective. Um, yeah, it is. Um, so, the next one, data generation. This um, this one takes longer because um, you know you have to figure out what you want to generate, and then still write code to generate it. Um, so it takes a lot more time to um, to uh, to program it, but um, you can uh, cover a lot more um, code paths usually. Right. Some uh, annoying things I've um, I've encountered while um, while developing fuzzers is um, first of all you've got bugs hiding behind bugs where um, one bug is so obvious that it, one bug is so annoying that it will always trigger on something and you will not be able to trigger a bug behind it. So that one kind of sucks. Um, in there are a few cases where you could still might be possible to get around the first bug and second bug, but because you're fuzzing, the first bug will always get triggered. So that one really sucks. Um, user friendliness is uh, oh, I'm, I'm, it's it's really bad. Um, yeah, honestly, I mean it's so annoying to fuzz some kind of program, and every time it gets a packet, you get a pop up saying, "This this packet is invalid." I'm like, I know it's invalid. I want you to break, you know. And usually it stops processing anything until you click OK. You know, so it's kind of user friendliness is, is really kind of annoying when you're fuzzing stuff. Um, yeah, memory leaks um, arguably. You can say memory leaks or bugs or security bugs, um, but if it's like memory leaks, like one or two bytes every time, it's not that much, and you usually don't feel it. But they can get pretty annoying when fuzzing, because if, if you're spitting out uh, a lot of lots and lots of packets in an endless loop, um, you know every time you send out some kind of packet, it might leak one or two bytes. So after you know five five million test runs, it's, you've leaked five million bytes. Um, so and sometimes the leak can get bigger. So you know, if, if you're going to be fuzzing something and it leaks a lot of stuff and sucks up a couple of gigs in, in a couple of minutes, you won't be, fuzz you won't be fuzzing it for long. Um, right. The other thing is, um, yeah, programs that are slow in general, um, they're, they're annoying to fuzz because you just have to wait a lot, a lot longer for your results. Um, usually, though, um, slow programs are interesting to fuzz because, um, I mean, if they're slow for what they're doing, because that means the programmer didn't really, probably didn't know what he was doing, and that doesn't usually also reflects in the quality of his code. I mean, like in terms of security, so they might be annoying to fuzz, but they're on the other side, they're also interesting because you just know there are going to be bugs there. Um, and of course, you know, you can only fuzz what's configured. If things haven't been configured, I mean, you won't be able to fuzz those code paths, obviously. And then the other thing, which is um, I've talked about it before, but which is really annoying when you're fuzzing is checksums, encryption, compression, all those things. Especially if it's like if it's n like uh, compression or encryption that's not publicly known. I mean, it's not an open standard. It's stuff that you have to reverse engineer. That's pure hell. Um, right. So, getting rid of these annoyances. Um, bug hiding behind a bug. Um, if it's open source, um, track the bug down and just fix it. If it's binary, um, you're kind of not so lucky because if you can track it down and patch it in the binary, I mean, depending upon what kind of bug it is, it might be trivial, um, but it might also be very hard. Um, you might also be able, uh, which I'll cover in the next one, but um, if, if it's binary, you might be able to, if, if you can isolate where it is, you might be able to preload it. Um, so yeah, um, the second one is user friendliness. That one's really annoying. Um, you can usually preload stuff. If you get like a pop-up for something, preload it and just get rid of that pop-up. 
Um, the other thing is that um, on macOS, you've got something which is called AppleScript. And what's so cool about AppleScript is, well, I'll show you that in the next slide. So, but keep in mind that AppleScript is really cool um, for uh, helping you fuzz stuff. Um, memory leaks, um, which is basically, you know, arguably um, a bug behind a bug, because memory leaks on themselves are bugs, I guess. Um, well, again, you know, if the same rules for bug behind a bug apply. You know, if it's open source, fix the memory leak if you can find it. If it's binary, you know, if you can find it, then if you can fix it, because um, binary is obviously a lot harder to patch than when you got source code. Um, but if you can fix it, you know, try and fix it, because memory leaks do matter when you're um, when you're fuzzing stuff. And then for uh, like the other stuff, like slow programs and fuzzing what's being configured and encryption stuff, um, you know. There's usually no easy way to get around. Maybe configuration, maybe if, if you know what to configure, not, not what not. But all the other things, there's no easy way to get around them. Um, you're just going to have to deal with them. So yeah, that, that really sucks. Um, so, but getting around some user friendliness, um, speci specifically on Mac OS, um, you've got AppleScript, and AppleScript is sort of a programming language, but it looks more like English than a programming language. Um, the, if you can see the code here, basically this is. Um, something I've used to fuzz Internet Explorer on um, macOS. And basically what you do is you, you know, tell Internet application Internet Explorer and then basically have a while loop in there and then open a Gopher URL. And this is pretty cool because in, in Internet Explorer, um, you don't have refresh when you're doing Gopher. You've got refresh in HTML, you've got no refresh in Gopher. And you could hit the um, refresh button a million times, but you know, your fingers start hurting or maybe they, they might even start to bleed, I don't know. Um, but if you've got AppleScript, you don't need those things. AppleScript will do that for you. You'll, say, you'll tell AppleScript, you know, do that, what I would usually do, and it'll just do it. And besides the fact that you will save, um, you'll save a lot of pain in your fingers, um, it'll be faster, because, um, you know, refreshing, you know, you got human interaction, but this is just, you know, this is just automated. So AppleScript's a godsend um, if you're gonna fuss stuff on macOS, but at the same time, it can cause problems because some applications on macOS, um, they either don't implement AppleScript and then you can't use it, or they've implemented really, really badly, so badly that um, when, you just, when you try to write some, um, uh, some AppleScript code, the, the thing will just crash when you're trying to communicate it with it. So, but besides that, AppleScript's really, really cool. Right. Um, determining, um, how stuff fails, because, um, I mean, it might sound a bit obvious, but sometimes it's kind of nice to have some pointers towards how, to, how these kind of things fail. Um, obviously, you know, crashes, usually those are pretty easy to detect. Um, but, you know, and I'll talk about that a little bit later in a very, um, very small snippet on the next slide. Uh, huge memory consumptions, they can usually be found with default tools, and um, I have a slide about that as well. Uh, reboots, yes, I mean, usually you notice a reboot, so. Um, same thing with hangs, you can usually notice them. Um, but yeah, that kind of depends what kind of hang, because sometimes, um, you know, sometimes you feel hangs, but sometimes you just don't, f I mean, if, you don't, if, you were look, if you're not looking at the application specifically, you might not feel it in your operating system. It depends on the bug. Right. So crashes, yeah, I mean, this is kind of obvious, but it looks cool though, doesn't it? Um, all right, so Cordon attached debugger, and I'll be talking about uh, debuggers quickly um, in a couple of slides. Um, so that's basically, you know, this, it crashed, and, you know, in this case, it's pretty easy to determine what's going on. Um, huge memory consumptions. This is, this is from a real case, by the way. Um, this is, uh, I was doing some fuzzing on Internet Explorer, and um, I made some uh, bitmap fuzzing tools. And at some point, I came across some bitmap, and um, you know, my mouse was hardly moving, and you know, th things were going very, very badly, and you know, there was a huge load. So I hit Alt Control Delete, and I go to Performance, and usually, you know, you see the page file uses history, and basically, all my physical memory just was gone. You know, Internet Explorer had just eaten all of it. So, and you know, it's easy to see it here. You know, and then at the you know the after picture, after Internet Explorer has died after I've killed it, you see all the performance, you know, it's all coming back. So it, it's kind of nice to see it in the graphical way. Um, so, but usually it's easy to detect these kind of things. 
Um, yeah, a reboot. Um, a while ago, um, I was fortunate enough to be at somebody, uh, be at a friend's place who had a Cisco, and I figured, you know, I've never fuzzed a Cisco before, so let's do that. And this was the result I got. Um, I, haven't, I haven't played with it before, because I know very little about Cisco devices, but it was fun, though, to see it break. And then you get, you know, some, some stuff in there, some registers, and then Cisco, decide, Cisco um, realizes it has crashed, and it reboots. So it's kind of neat to see those kind of things. But um, Hangs is, yeah, it's another Internet Explorer thing. Um, basically, you know, if, if your CPU um, memory usage for some application um, never drops until you kill it, you know, something's up. So, um, seeing more than just a crash. Um, this is just a couple of pointers. Um, I really don't have time to go into detail on any of these things, but if you're interested in some of these things, you should stick around for next talk by Richard. Um, he'll be giving you a really cool tour of um, some of the things in IDA Pro, which, is, which I mentioned here, um, and how you can um, figure out some structures um, of, bin of uh, binaries and how we can use those for um, fuzzing, for example. Um, so, but, um, you know, if, if you're fuzzing something, you know, try to attach a, a debugger. You know, you've seen GDB, but um, the, the thing about GDB is that it's not really that wonderful. I mean, it's nice if, if, if you have your code compiled with debug and all these kind of things and you've sprinkled some printfs around and things like that. Um, but if you're going to fuzz things that, um, will create threads and that will fork and that will call the execute system call, GDB is kind of bad because GDB can't handle threads that well. It basically breaks on a lot of thread stuff. Uh, execute system call is just as bad. Fork kind of depends. If, you, if you're lucky, it doesn't. It does work. If you're not lucky, it doesn't. Um, all the debug is one of the uh, Windows debuggers. It's pretty neat. I've done look at some of that stuff. Pretty cool. Uh, WinDBG is uh, sort of like AudioDBG, but it's made by Microsoft. Uh, Softize is um, kind of like the, one of the huge debuggers in Windows. It's a curl debugger, and you know, if something um, breaks, you can get it to pop off. Uh, so this is just some of the uh, debugs that you might want to uh, look at. Um, these assemblers can also be helpful if, if you fuss something and you know, you've got an idea where it's gone wrong, but you don't know exactly what's gone wrong. You can fire up your, deep, uh, your disassembler and look at the entire program or large parts of the program. Um, IDA Pro is obviously, I mean, this, this one's kind of unfair because like IDA Pro is like, um, it's like the disassembler. You know, it's, there's not a single one that's better probably than IDA Pro. And Object Dunk as well, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't really compare to IDA. Object Dump is a really, really simple tool. Um, sometimes Object Dump is useful. Um, usually it's not that useful though. Um, IDA Pro is amazingly cool. You, you guys should, um, if you, if you want to know some more about, about IDA, you should definitely stick around and see Richard's talk. Um, right. Yeah, the, the thing is that you should, um, when you're um, debugging stuff, try to keep track of everything that's forked and, and spawns that have been thread, uh, threads that have been spawned. Excuse me. Um, if you're using GDB, you're kind of out of luck because um, GDB will probably um, uh, crash on some uh, thread stuff. Right. Um, some more utilities. Um, for Unix, you've got S-trace and L-trace. S-trace will give you some nice uh, information for uh, system calls that we used, and L-trace um, does pretty much a similar thing, um, but for system calls. And um, on Windows, you've got some, a tool that FX developed, which is Dumbug, and it can do, it can do similar things. Um, the other thing for seeing more than just a crash is looking at your log files. If you see something like that in your log files, you know, something's up, you know. Somebody tried some kind of format string bug, and apparently they succeeded, at least in triggering it. Right. Um, right. Uh, okay. Um, extending existing fuzzers. Um, that's one of the things that you should definitely um, do, because the, the thing with, like, um, for example, the um, HTML, uh, H the Mangle Me tool from Mikhail Zalewski is that it was just sc scratching the surface. It only fuzzed a small part of HTML, and it didn't even cover anything else that the browser did. So um, just if, if you just take any fuzzer that anybody ever made, just 
take it and look what it does and then think about things they've forgotten. If you implement those and then just run your tool against whatever they ran it before and all the bugs they fixed, just run it again and I can almost guarantee you that you'll find new things. Um, so um, you don't always have to start from scratch, just take other people's work, build upon it, and usually you find new, new things. Um, it, another example of this is, and this is actually a really, uh, good one, um, is the Protoss, um, this, um, the uh, SIP um, fuzzing tool they had. Is, I mean, they've, they've spent months trying to figure out exactly where things can go wrong, and they've, they've worked things out in, in, in detail. Uh, and so they've covered a lot of code paths in a lot of um, uh, devices or software that parses SIP. And so they, they probably, if, if you run something against Protoss, you can catch most of them. Um, but then a couple of months ago, um, somebody discovered a bug in Ethereal in SIP parsing. And this was one of the main attributes of SIP. And the, the, the actual bug in Ethereal was a, a trivial string copy where you had a stack smash and you know, buffer overflow 101. But the thing is, because the guys from Protoss had run their tool against Ethereal, and they discovered several bugs in the SIP parsing. But they had missed a specific one. So if you had taken the RFCs and look at the way people implement stuff, you would have extended um, Protoss for this thing, you would have been able to find that that particular bug in Ethereal. Um, so e even if people have put a lot of thought into developing fuzzers, even if they spent months developing a fuzzer and putting a, you know, a, lot, of, a lot of hours into that, they, they'll still have missed some things that you might think about. Just implement it, run the tool, tools again, usually you find cool stuff. Right. So my conclusion, because I know you're all bored of me and you want to go out. Um, but my conclusion is that um, fuzzing is amazingly cool. And even if, it, if I sound boring to you, you should still go out and try some fuzzers because it's like you have to experience, um, you just have to experience fuzzing and see what it's all about and, and get this warm, fuzzy feeling the first time you break something. Um, but so fuzzing is amazingly cool. Also, it's, if you compare um, the amount of stuff that you can find with fuzzing in a time frame and then see how how much time it will take you to do a code audit and come to the same conclusions, um, it'll probably be like a factor of 10 or something. Um, I'm not saying that you should get rid of code audits and only do um, fuzzing, because there are some tools that, uh, some bugs that are uh, hard or almost in, or pretty much impossible to fuzz that you might be able to find with code audit. But if you're just out to um, find a couple of bugs, um, you know, f fuzzing will save you a lot of time. I mean, I, I spent the last, uh, about two years um, doing an unhealthy amount of code auditing, and then I discovered fuzzing. It was like a whole new world opened uh, for me. So you can find a lot of cool things in a, a short period of time with fuzzing, where it would otherwise take you um, days or weeks or months or even years um, when doing code audits. Um, and uh, fuzzing is probably the most widely used method of finding bugs these days. Um, and of course, the final conclusion, the coolest one, is that people cannot write decent parsing code. Right. And this is, right, okay, so, some advertisement. Um, th there's a magazine called MISC, and there have been some of these around. I think there have been, the guys from MISC bought like 600 of them with them here. And it's a magazine about computer security. And this started off in France, and in France, I think they're up to issue 22 or 23. And since a couple of months, they've got MISC magazine here in Germany. And issue three contains an article about fuzzing, which a friend of mine made, and he's covered some of my things. Um, so um, you should definitely check out MISC. It's really cool. Although I don't know exactly what's in it because I don't read German. <laughs> but I've talked to some of the editors, and they've told me that it's re a really cool tool. <laughs> uh, magazine, yes. OK. Right. So some interesting links, and this is basically where um, I'll shut up then. As, um, the first one's violating assumptions with fuzzing, which is a paper written by uh, two people at Microsoft, um, Michael Howard and another guy whose name I've forgotten. And basically this is their, um, their experience that they've had throughout the, uh, a couple of years at Microsoft doing fuzzing and uh, some of the things that they've noticed uh, doing fuzzing. And there's a lot of cool stuff in there. If you, um, if you can get your hands on that paper, um, if you're at a university, you can get it for free. If you're not at a university, you have to pay IEEE 20, uh, 20 euros to get five pages of text. 
So, um, or if, if you're smart, you'll just bounce from some university and get it for free anyway. Um, I wasn't that smart. I, I actually paid them 20 bucks because I didn't know I could bounce off universities. Um, but so if you're smart, you're not at university, just bounce over some and just get it for free. Um, so, but that paper's pretty neat. Um, yeah, uh, the, the next one's the, basically the um, talk that Dave Vitell gave at Black Hat in 2002 um, about Spike. You should definitely look at it. If, if you're interested in Spike, uh, that, those slides are a good starting point. Um, the next one is, is um, uh, slides from presentation that FX made, which I really, really like. And basically, um, at least from what I understood, that, that the slides or the talk was meant to show people that hacking is really hard work. Although it's really fun, it's a lot of work. And uh, it, covers, um, it covers more than just fuzzing. It covers fuzzing, um, uh, adding static analysis, and doing binary analysis. And then it also covers the export development and the making exports reliable, and then something like don't use C, because C takes too long to develop stuff in. So, but that one's really cool. It gives you, it gives you a more complete picture. Um, right, the next one's a talk of um, two guys from iDefense who talked at Black Hat this year. Um, about file fuzzing. And that one's interesting too. Um, if you've got some time, definitely check it out. Mm. Then there's the talk from Brett uh, Mune, I think that's, that's his name, um, from um, at stake at the time, um, discussing Combust and how cool it really is. And if you manage to um, read that uh, PDF, you'll see um, how cool the configuration options are in Combust. And then obviously, you know, some. Um, some advertisers for myself, you know, that's my website. And you can find some of my fuzzing tools there. And I've got a collection of fuzzing tools that other people made that you can find there. And I've made some slight modifications to some things that people made because um, I thought some things weren't, uh, were off or wrong or they missed some stuff. And you can find them all there. Um, if you're interested in, in fuzzing or if I've got you all hyped up for fuzzing, um, you should go there and there's some cool stuff there. Um, the uh, yeah, the one under that is advanced of block-based fuzzing, which is where Dave Vitell um, explains to people who read it how cool block-based fuzzing is and why uh, not using block-based fuzzing sucks, or why it sucks according to him. Um, the last one's uh, about the, a talk that M Matthew Franz did, uh, Black Hat, in 2003, covering this PIF tool, Protocol Independent Fuzzer. And um, basically, the, the tool's more about um, uh, Figure, uh, showing people how good or how bad um, BGP is these days in, um, in terms of security. Right, um, that's about it. Any questions? No? Nope. No questions? Okay, that's good, saves me time. Thank you.